today. The reason I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I was born in this country. It isn't what you have, it's what you're taught about the values of life. We trying to save souls. So there's a rule of life, but then you're either growing or you're dying. And like an old friend once said, we as Americans need to start winning again. Everyone should ask this question. Am I willing to endure the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice it takes to be a champion? Welcome to the Lou Holtz Podcast. I'm very flattered, honored to have one of the great people in this country. Not just a great announcer, but just one of the great people. Reese Davis is one of sports industry's preeminent hosts and a mainstay of ESPN for more than 25 years. He's the host of ESPN's Emmy Award winning college game day built by the Home Depot. He's also a host for premier college football events, including the College Football Playoff National Championship and the NFL Draft on NBC, in addition to select play-by-play assignments for college football. Davis also serves the host of the college football playoff top 25 ranking show. During the basketball season, Davis is the host of College Game Day, covered by State Farm, a role he has occupied since the show debuted in 2005. Before joining ESPN, Davis worked for WJRT-TV in Flint, Michigan as a sports announcer and anchor. From 19... 19- 88 to 1993. He was a sports anchor and sports director at WRBL TV in Columbus, Georgia. A graduate from the University of Alabama. Now, while I know it, uh, nobody cheered for Alabama more than he did. <laughs> With a bachelor's degree from the School of Communication and News and Public Firm. Reese, just welcome here and congratulations on just a great career. It's wonderful to see you again. You've had a very impressive career. And I was fortunate enough to work with you for 10 years, and you covered up for me and all the mistakes I made. You guys are the experts, but even the weatherman, you don't have to be a weatherman to know the wind's blowing. Those guys in orange on the defensive line, greater than mm. those guys in white on the offensive line for South Carolina. Today they were. No, every day. Every day. Oh, no, no. Big no. Big what inspired you to enter into this line of work, other than the fact you had a natural talent for it? Well, Coach, thank you for having me on. First of all, it's always an honor to uh, to be part of anything that you're associated with. But I, I think I always wanted to do it. Uh, my uh, my standard line has been that I always thought that broadcasting would come at the end of a long and illustrious playing career, but that didn't quite work out. You know, my talent my talent ran out after high school. Although my high school teammates would tell you it ran out a long time before that. So you know, it's. Uh, it's just something I was always fascinated by because I was the, the little kid that, you know, after we finished playing the games, you know, outside in the backyard and stuff, I would be sitting there on, uh, you know, late at night trying to twist the radio dial back, back before every game was on television just right to listen to, you know, the LSU broadcast or if it was the summer to pick up the Braves or the St. Louis Cardinals or something. And so I was always fascinated not only by the games themselves and playing them, but also in and the people who broadcast them and brought them to the fans. So it's something that I always wanted to do. And uh, really, I'm, I'm fortunate that it's worked out as well as it has for me. When I say that you have a natural talent, I mean that sincerely. I've never worked or been around anybody that has as much talent as you have. When did you notice you had this unique ability to be able to paraphrase things into words and correct people for use of the wrong names. And the list goes on and on. You know what I'm talking about, Reese. Uh, well, my favorite movie of all time, uh, Lou, is a movie called Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And there's a scene in the movie where George Clooney is uh, meeting the John Goodman character. And Clooney um, says to to Goodman's character, he says, I detect that like me, you've been endowed with the gift of gab. So I think I've been running my mouth pretty much out of the womb. And I've never been nervous to get up and and speak in front of people or anything like that. And, you know, I don't, I don't really know, except that the stories have become embellished over the years, but my, my family, cousins, you know, teammates and stuff, they tell these stories about how after we would play a game that I would be uh, commentating on the game in the back of the bus on the way back. Those stories over the years as I've, you know, risen at ESPN have become embellished a bit, but it's okay. I like them. There's probably some truth to them. 
So I was always, you know, I was probably always running my mouth, probably much to my parents' chagrin sometimes. Well, many people enter this line of work, but very few are successful than you have been. What do you think was the turning point in your career, Reach? There have been a, there have been a few of them, uh, Coach. I, I think, you know, first of all, the biggest one was getting hired at WJRT in Flint, Michigan. Because I had been, it turns out that being in Columbus at WRBL was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because I met my wife there. But professionally, I kind of got stuck there. I sent out, you know, hundreds and hundreds of tapes and couldn't get a job. And finally, they hired me at Channel 12 in Flint, Michigan. A man called Jim Bliker hired me. And after I'd been there about two weeks, I walked into his office and I said, why did you hire me? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I've been trying to get out of Columbus for years. And I got no, you know, I got no, um, no nibbles, no bites, no offers. And I said, and here you are. You're the guy that I replaced left to go to Seattle. He replaced the guy who went to Dallas, who replaced the guy who went to Detroit. They had sent news anchors to Los Angeles out of that station in Tampa and many other great places. It was a springboard. And so I knew it was a really good job, though Flint didn't have the best reputation. And he, he said, you know, he said the quality of your, uh, the technical quality of your tape wasn't great. He said, but we imagined what you might look like with our stuff. And that gave me a great deal of confidence. I think that he hired me and then, you know, I was able to work with some really good people in Flint that helped me grow. And I was, only, I was there less than a year and a half before I went to ESPN and at ESPN, I've, I've said many times, I think the turning point was the night. It was an unfortunate situation, but it was the night of the Olympic bombing. I think there were a lot of doubts at, among ESPN management about my ability and my, whether I would have any longevity at all at ESPN. And Stuart Scott and I were hosting SportsCenter the night of the Olympic bombing. And as it turned out, we were on the air with, you know, no script, no prompter, no plan other than them just telling us, talk to this guy, ask this question. Here's what this report's going, relay it to the people. And we were on for, I, I, I know it was 10 consecutive hours and it might have been, it might have been 11 or 12. And after that, things seemed to turn for me a little bit. And then of course, and then of course, working with you because over, over my shoulder here for people who are watching, I, you know, I've got wins, losses and lessons in here. So, you know, working, working with you was a big deal. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a quick story, Coach. This happens quite often. You know, people will ask me. They'll say, uh, you know, come up to me and I'll be with my wife. And um, they'll say, how are you doing? And I say, don't tell people about your problems. 90% don't care and 10% are glad you got them. <laughs> and uh, and my, wife, my wife would say, my wife said, do you think if you hadn't spent 10 years with Coach Holtz that you would be able to converse with people? And I said, uh, I said, I said, yeah, I'd still be able to talk to them. I just wouldn't be nearly as funny. No, don't pull it back. Explore the space. I mean, you're going to want that cowbell because guess what? I've got a feet. And the only prescription is more cowbell. I'm doing the services so by the end the heck out of it. Cowbell. More cowbell. It is a journey. This journey does not end. But we go on to Norman. The college football world turns, and we turn with it. Game plans disappear. BCS dreams take over. But wherever I go, there you are. The luck of the Irish, your fate and fortune rest with number five. With number five is in Monte Teo. The outcome, inevitable. That's awesome. <laughs> so, but there have been a lot of turning points, and I do believe that the things that you, Mark, and I did together on the air uh, were instrumental in helping, helping my growth for sure. Well, the final verdict, you made some of the worst calls ever made in this world. I mean, Hamilton Berger would have won more cases against Perry Mason than you did. But I tell you, you were unbelievably talented. You were put on that rope, and you think you're in a courtroom. You had a ability to motivate people. I'm going to take it under advisement. 
issue a continuance and what i'm retiring to chambers no boys. chambers no we i've got on my robe last weekend of the season you I, can't do this i've got on my robe and i'm retiring to chambers. you have to make a decision that's what you're there for you can't do a continuance no. it's the last weekend of the season this is the last regular weekend of the season I, bailiffs get them out of here i tell you why you're lucky he didn't make a decision because if he did it would have been for another day he should and be he not go against and that's anyway. why he's not making one he doesn't want to lie and he doesn't want to go against another day but so obvious why can't you say i know you look good in a leprechaun uniform mark and you, Wait, did you watch i gotta ask i gotta ask you this right quick though because i just found this out about the two of us um recently i don't i can't believe we didn't know this back in the day although i didn't do it as often did you watch Perry Mason last night at all? Oh, I, I watch him every night. He's on at 10, 11.30. I watch him I, every I night because I'm in love with Della Street, but she has since <laughs> passed away. <laughs> but I, I watched it last night. I, do that. I watch him every night, virtually every night, too. It's, yeah. uh, it's good comforting television. <laughs> it is that. And, and all your times in the sports industry, you see the rise and fall of many teams. No one team is always good to be the best. In your opinion, what single thing impacts the success of a team the most? And I know you're a strong Alabama fan, but i got to pass this on to our viewers. <laughs> you, you graduated from University of Alabama and a strong to Crimson Tide band, and you married a girl from Auburn. <laughs> and that's unbelievable. And she said, oh, I, I'm not real involved in the game. You know, I went there. But I tell you what, your daughter was, your son was big Auburn fan. Your daughter was a big yeah. Alabama. It was just unbelievable. It was one of the funniest <laughs> things in the world. But what made Alabama such a great team all those years? Uh, consistency and leadership. And, and I don't just mean the person at the top. I mean, you know, Nick Saban is a lot is a lot like you, uh, a lot like uh, many great coaches in that he's never satisfied and doesn't doesn't spend a lot of time relishing the accomplishment because the the satisfaction and the joy he found was in building and pursuing excellence, a standard that is never really reached. I was trying to work toward uh, the standard that I wanted the people in the organization to work toward and the standard of excellence that we were looking for in the players to get them to be the best that they could be. That, that's all I've ever asked a guy. You know, be the best that you can be. Don't worry about winning. Don't worry about losing. What do you have to do to get the outcome that you want by focusing on the things that are going to help you get the outcome? And I think that the programs that have been great over the years, whether it's whether it's Alabama, whether it's Notre Dame under your watch, whether it's Nebraska under Tom Osborne, um, the the you know, and many many others, the number one trait that I see is that uh, a lack of satisfaction with the accomplishment, pride in the accomplishment, allowing the accomplishment to help set a standard, but not becoming complacent in that and still striving to become better. It's sort of a it's it's a pretty remarkable thing that Nick accomplished all of those years at at Alabama. I mean, 17 years where you know after the first season, I mean they were in the mix. I mean, there's a stat, coach. I've forgotten what it is. They played like it's something almost ridiculous in the last 16 16 of his 17 years. They played like I want to say four or five games where they were eliminated from national championship consideration. That, that's hard to do because people become complacent. They don't want to do the things that get them there. And I think the same thing is, is true almost in any walk of life. Success breeds complacency. And, you know, you, you're only as good as in television. You're only as good as your last show. Like, you know this from all of those years. We could have the greatest day of TV, you know, covering the games, doing halftimes, doing Phil shows. And if we did something you know, that was wrong or got screwed up on final. It sort of ruined the whole day. And once you kick the field goal, that means the touchdown would beat you. Personally, you're better off. Tennessee, off Alabama now. Pardon? Personally, you're better Tennessee, off. Tennessee, Alabama now. Pardon? You know, and it's, I think teams are like that as well. And to be able to, to get a group of players to, 
to buy into that and to continue to pursue it and enjoy their success, but not become complacent. And I think that's the biggest factor. I think that's a great observation. I have a rule that you either grow or you're dying and doesn't have a thing to do with age. It has everything to do by trying to get better. See, there's a rule of life that said you're either growing or you're dying. The tree's either growing or it's dying. So is grass. So is a marriage. So is a business. So is a person. Doesn't have a thing to do with age. My birthday candles cost more than a cake. <laughs> but it has everything to do with my trying to get better, my trying to prove we got on top and say, you know, this is pretty good. Let's maintain it. Let's not take any risk. And Nick Saban and the great coaches were never satisfied with what they did. And a football team, like a business, goes through four different stages. Number one, you learn how to be competitive. You learn how to be competitive by learning how to block and tackle. Then you learn how to win. You learn how to win because you do little things the right way. And then you learn how to handle winning. Because once you start winning, everybody wants credit. They forget what it was like when you're on the bottom. Oh, we're going to win anyway. Then you get to stage four, the championship level. And that's where your players take charge of the culture of the company. And then whether it be ESPN, whether it be a football team, whatever, when the people take charge of the culture, where they get on one another about the standard we have and the way you do it. And I will say this. You you set a standard that I didn't want to go into that studio without being totally prepared because I knew you were going to be. Now, how do you balance having a very busy career and yet at the same time being a good family man? And I know that you are an excellent family man. I know your son played baseball in the Ivy League. I know he's injured. I know the dedication you had. And I know what a beautiful daughter you've had. I have Thanksgiving dinner at your home every year. And, and, and just you're a great family man. How did you handle that? Uh, first of all, I had a great example from my parents who put a lot of emphasis on time together. Uh, you know, on it didn't have to be anything uh, grandiose because growing up we couldn't afford any you know extravagant elaborate vacations. But my my folks put a lot of emphasis on time spent together with family, and that really I think resonated with me, and I, it was Im impressed on my heart how important it was. So when Lee and I had children, that just sort of was a natural thing for both of us, and I think as the demands of your career or if, if you're in business, if you own a business or whatever it might be, as they come along, you have to make sure that you are present when you're there. And I do think that in many ways, it sets a pretty good example for your children if you work hard and they know, okay, you know, in your case, you've got a wonderful family and great children. Your job was time consuming and demanding. And they knew that that sets an example too, that you have to apply yourself and devote yourself to what you said you were going to do. And it's also a way, uh, you know, as, as men, I know it's not always real popular these days, but we are by nature providers. So we are providing for our families too. I think that sets a great example, but when you're there, you should be there. And, you know, I, I'm not perfect in that regard. I'm sure there were many times that I was you know, playing with the kids or on a family outing, my mind was wandering to whatever, you know, ESPN drama was going on or whatever, you know, if I was coming to the end of the contract or some assignment I wanted or whatever it might be. But you have to really do your best to realize that those things go away. The relationship with your family is the thing that will endure. And so when you are there, you need to be there for them so that they know you care, so that they're develops that relationship and that deep trust that, uh, that are there for family bonds. And, and hopefully we did okay. We're very proud of, uh, of both the kids and what they have become and are becoming. And, you know, hopefully we did a good enough job in terms of being there when we were able to, um, able to be away from work. As I've often said, the only friends you have in this world with things they'll go well. Those you eat with, sleep with, bleed with, pray with, cry with, and that's your family and your teammates or the people you work with. But what values did you try to instill in your children? That whatever they pursued, that they pursue it hard and do their very best at it, but that their chosen careers, that's not who they are, it's what they do. Um, Christopher's still playing baseball. Uh, he's, he just signed with the Evansville Otters in the Frontier League, so he's been playing pro ball for a couple years now, trying to, you know, 
climb up and, and get into affiliate ball and, and so on. And, you know, it's something he's dedicated his life to. And I remind him still, and I have since he was a little kid, it's, it's something you do is not who you are. My daughter's an aspiring actress. She's, you know, she finished at NYU. She's living in New York. She's doing all of the audition stuff. And same thing to her. Uh, you know, this is, this is great. Pursue it hard. Give it everything you've got. In the end, it's something you do. It's not who you are. So I tried to really impress upon them, and I probably had great failings in terms of being an example from time to time. But your relationship with the Lord in our house is paramount. And it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. And it doesn't mean that you're um, not ever going to do anything that people would point at and go, wait, that, that's not you know, what a, a person who claims to be a member of the Lord's family would do. You're going to slip. But it has to be your baseline. It has to be your core. It has to be your, uh, your North Star, so to speak. It has to, it has to be the thing that tries to put you back on track when you do inevitably veer off course. And so that's what we really tried to impress on them. And we tried to do that by example. And, you know, as I said, we, we weren't perfect in that regard or even close to it, but it was something that they knew that it was important to us and we believed it. And if we did deviate, that we would, that we would try as, as best we could to get back on track. Well, you, you, express yourself so well and the fact that you just said it's not who you are it's what you do and i think that is so true with so many people now what does it mean to stay active in your faith uh what advice do you have for those who are just entering their faith journey i think the one thing is that if you build any kind of relationship you have to communicate and I think the easy thing is, is to encourage prayer. And that's really, really important. But how many relationships do we have where all of the communication is one way, right? Uh, pretty soon, that relationship is not as fulfilling as it could be. So I think it's really important to spend time in the Word, study the Bible. Um, I, think, I think treating people with dignity and respect and kindness and uh, not compromising your values, but at the same time, uh, treating people well and realizing that, that we're, you know, that we're all the same and that we all are in need of, we're all in need of the Lord. We're all in need of help. Uh, we're all in need of each other and, you know, and not, um, not treating people poorly because you, you think because you host a TV show that you're entitled to something or you, you know, you're, have this certain job or you make this amount of money or whatever and, and you're entitled to something more than someone else. I think just being very cognizant of, of how you treat others and maintaining that relationship and making sure your relationship is in your faith is a two-way communication so that you learn and are convicted as you, as you try to grow. I wish you would have given me that lecture at about 1 o'clock in the morning when I would lose my temper because it took all forever to do the show. No no doubt about it. I, I, I had three rules. Do the right thing, do the very best you can, and always show people you care. And I violated that last rule quite often. The later the night, the more often I violated that rule. But uh, I, remember what, I remember one night, I remember one night, you were talking about the final verdict, and you probably know I'm going to tell this story. Um, you had beaten Mark several times in a row, and so I, I'll admit the judge might have been a little crooked going in. I was, oh, like, I was like, I was like, I was like, man, I was like, uh, Mark's going to have to really present a batter. I mean, Mark needs to win. He's getting a little frustrated. So Mark won, and you got mad, and you're still you're still fussing at me about it at the end. And finally, I looked at you and I said, Coach, you can't win every week. And you looked back at me and shot back and said, the heck I can't. <laughs> and I started laughing. I, I to, don't want to, to do that damn thing is, anymore. To whom much I is given, much is expected. I beat it. I'm not doing it again. I, 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 that ain't an act. Hell with it. Three and he oh. Oh and three. three. Oh and three. Oh and three. Oh and three. Forget, oh and three. Forget, about, oh and three. Forget about it. I know, and I think uh, I think I started laughing, which probably made you matter. But was... <laughs> that's exactly how I, I felt about it. But you know, it, it's just caring about other people. Now, yeah, the theme of this show is coaching America back to greatness. What do you believe needs to be done in this country 
to turn a lot of things around. Because I don't, I'm an old man. I don't like the direction certain things are going. I'm one of these people that was raised. Let me make my own choices, and I'll stand with the ramifications of my choices. But what do you think really needs to happen in this country? I think there's, you know, I think there's been a profound lack of faith and a a deviation from, you know, following the Lord. And I realize that, you know, I, I know the, the Bill of Rights and constitutional provisions. I'm not talking about, you know, imposing uh, religion on anyone. What I'm talking about is that that inner that inner drive to have a set of standards and doctrines that are good for people. It, it's very much like if we say that everything is okay, it's, it's very much like a, a little kid going up to uh, you know, a pond with a fence around it and it says, don't feed the alligators. And, and you think, well, I'll, I'll let him feed the alligator one little piece of chicken. That won't hurt. You know, and then you know, before long, it becomes a little more and a little more, and now you are putting people in danger, you know, because because things, you know, they it, you've become accustomed to things that are forbidden for a reason, and I think that I think the one thing that would help would be um, if we could somehow find our moral compass collectively, that um, that we would uh, that we would realize that uh, sometimes stipulations, rules, regulations, laws, whatever might be imposed uh, that are painful in the moment but good in the long run. And I think that one thing that has happened is that um, I heard someone else, I, this is not an original thought, but I heard someone else put it this way, is that there is something in human nature, and it's not a good thing necessarily, but human beings generally are attracted to uh, the taboo. They're attracted to feeding the alligators if they're not supposed to. That little, you know, that little <laughs> bit of daring and danger is sort of part of the human nature that you have to fight. If nothing is taboo and everything is okay, then there's no there's no exhilaration from it, and you escalate looking for the next thing that will give you that. And as as those types of uh, morals and standards are broadened and broadened and broadened at some point they're broadened to the point of the detriment of of the entire group so i think that if we could find find faith moral compass um celebrate people who live their lives in exemplary ways i mean the first guy that comes to mind in our business and in sports and there are many 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 others but uh you know what tim tebow uh, does with his foundation and you know his um, desire to help people and to, and to fight things uh, such as sex trafficking that you know are uh, an abomination on uh, on our society. And so, why we're here today is to be able to ask you to say yes to a bill that we're going to present. And this bill really has one goal: to build a rescue team. Because there's so many frontline warriors and heroes, but there's just not enough, and we need to support them. And we need more of them to get to these 50,000 boys and girls. So this bill is strictly to create a, a rescue team that has the funding, the support, the training, the technology, so that they can get to these 50,000. You know, I've had the privilege of playing for a lot of sports teams in my life. And almost all of them, we've had incredible resources to give us a better chance at winning a game, something that ultimately, as much as we care about it, doesn't matter. Why would we not give as much, if not more, resources to the frontline heroes that are going after the most vulnerable boys and girls on the planet? Those types of things that if we would, you know, rather than mock those types of people, which happened to Tim a lot, um, that we maybe celebrated them a little bit more. And the vast majority of the people did celebrate Tim Tebow. I mean, heck, the guy sold out minor league baseball stadiums around the country just because people wanted to come and, and see him, you know, so that he got a lot, of, uh, a lot of praise as well. But I think if there was more of, more of a universal uh, praise, acceptance, and value placed on what's good, you know, what is, what is good for people uh, inherently and not, uh, not just getting to the point where everything is okay. That's a great answer on that. Now, I worked with you for 10 years, and we're with Mark May, one of the great people in this world. 
but I've watched you. Mark, and, uh, and Reese, it doesn't matter who's on that set with you. You have a unique ability to bring out the best in them. Is there anybody that you worked with that upset you? <laughs> uh, and look, over the years, you know, you've argued with a, a lot of people when you've been on the set, but I wouldn't say uh, upset. I mean, Jalen Milrow often wears his own branded apparel reading LANK across the front. It's an acronym that stands for Let a Naysayer Know. Being told by his former offensive coordinator, that Bill O'Brien. That is not what I thought. Is that not what you thought? Boy, let a naysayer know. Let a naysayer know. <laughs> of course. The professional's right in the middle of his <laughs> lead. That's all right. I just keep I going. You almost lost me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. Real tight up here, as you were. I just want to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> you were too smooth with that. I thought it was going down. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I thought it was going down out here. <laughs> Mark and I have argued at times. Uh, Trev Alberts and I argued. You and I probably argued. Billis and I have certainly argued. Um, so I wouldn't say upset, though. I've been really uh, lucky. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm too easygoing or something, but I've been – I've been really fortunate, and I think one of the things that I ought to point out more often is the whatever success I have had has been attributed largely to the people I've worked with. You, Mark, Jay, um, Kirk Herbstreet, uh, you know, for a number of years, and even, you know, even Pat McAfee recently, Digger Phelps, you know, for, you know, for a long time, you know, that worked with Digger in basketball and, and remained close to him, so... You know, I, my success is because I've worked with people who've cared very much about the product. Um, left out Desmond, too. I shouldn't have left out Desmond. Lafonso Ellis, David Pollock, you know, people that, um, that I have deep relationships with. Um, you know, I think I've worked with people who care very much about the product. They're good teammates. And I try to be a good teammate to them. I mean, oh. you know me. I've got stuff I want to say, but I always try to know to know my lane like for instance i think it's you know it's perfectly reasonable that you know that i could argue with billis about a team that should or should not be in the ncaa tournament or uh, whether a coach should have called a timeout at a certain juncture but if i'm start if i'm arguing with him about footwork in the post or if i'm arguing with desmond howard about the proper release technique against press coverage or if i'm arguing with you about the about the footwork a defensive back should use in a certain coverage, then that's not where you should argue. So I think if you know know your limitations, try to put your teammates in the best spot that they can be, and then I've been lucky to work with uh, with great people. So that haven't made me mad very often. And and if I do, I just tell my wife, and she listens to me and then rolls her eyes and tells me to hush up again. <laughs> so. Well, your, your wife is a special young lady, and you, you're a special guy. And the success you've had, it doesn't amaze me, but it pleases me. And I enjoy watching you on a continuous basis. Now, ready to go into March Madness. Who should I put my money on? Oh, man. If I if I tell you wrong, I'm never going to hear the end of this. But uh, <laughs> you're, I know, you're, I know. You're, you're wrong on the final verdict a couple of times. I know a lot. That bother you. I think I think Connecticut's the best team again. So I, I will probably, I will pick them to win the national championship barring some type of you know, misfortune between now and then. I think they're the best team. I, even though the, the program historically and their coach who's excellent uh, hasn't had the success in the tournament that one might expect, I really like Tennessee and Rick Barnes this year too. I think they've got, um, you know, they, they've got a deep roster. They've got a star that's a transfer in from Northern Colorado named Dalton Connect. I mean, he's throwing, you know, he's averaging well into the 20s, and he is capable of dropping 40 like he did Saturday against Kentucky. So they've got the type of guy that you can ride to a championship. So those those are the two teams right off the top of my head. And when North Carolina is engaged and focused and concentrating as they were Saturday night again against Duke, they're as good as anybody, but they are prone to lulls. I like – they're one of the best teams in the country, Coach, and I've called them losing on the road at a very mediocre Georgia Tech team and losing at home to Clemson, who's good, but probably shouldn't beat North Carolina at home. So they're a little bit prone to, to lulls, 
But those are the three teams off the top of my head that I that I think are really that are really good and most likely to win it. I can't I can't argue with you at all. One last final question: Who in the world came up with final verdict? How did that, how'd that come about? I show up one day, you say, "Well, we're going to have his final verdict." You put on the robe, you have the thing, and man, it's just like a courtroom. You know, I'm I'm trying to think whose idea it was. It might have been Jerry Madeline's idea, um, but I'm not I'm not positive that it was. I know that our directors, both of our directors, Joe Santagata and then later uh, uh, Chuck Chicarillo, um, they uh, they really, really got into it. In fact, I think Joe, we called him Joe Love. Joe brought the robe, and I think Joe lives in the New Haven area, and he got it from a judge who wanted me to know that he had sent many a mobster to prison in that room. <laughs> and so, I, so right. I'm not, yeah, to be honest, I should, I should go back and, and dig that up. I'm not sure whose idea that was for. I, I would be surprised if it was Jerry Manlon. He came I up think it was. I ideas. think it was Jerry's. But it was fun showing up because I never for, knew for sure what we were going to be doing. But, Reese, I can't thank you enough for coming on this show. You had so much to it. and You're so intelligent, but you also have common sense. So congratulations on your success. But if what you did yesterday looked big to you, then you haven't done much today. God bless you and your family. Thank you, Coach. Always a pleasure to be with you. And he walks away after winning his 100th game as the head coach here at Notre Dame. The reason I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I was born in this country. It isn't what you have, it's what you're taught about the values of life. We trying to save souls. Say there's a rule of life, but then you're either growing or you're dying. And like an old friend once said, we as Americans need to start winning again. Everyone should ask this question. Am I willing to endure the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice it takes to be a champion?